We start with chapter 21, translating our code. So for, our, for this chapter, I chose to focus on the HTML. It, I think it was the same thing the previous cohort did. It's because the LaTeX side is just confusing. It's like a lot of things happen. It's kind of too much. And I think like Kevin said, it's a chapter that kind of binds well all the things in meta programming using a little of everything so i think it's better you have a the example with a, with html you can see everything but you don't have you don't see it in depth it's like it's a lot less confusing so okay we start and translate our code translate our code is it's kind of like R has the first class environment, the lexical scope in the metro programming. It makes R very, it makes R very powerful to translate R to, to other languages. One example is the translation to SQL, SQL with the DB player. You can use the translate SQL, SQL function to translate, to translate R code directly to SQL. In this chapter, uh, Hadley, Hadley did the same transformation of SQL but with HTML. And that's what I'm going to do here. Can I ask you a question? Sorry to interrupt you at the beginning, but this, this term here, first class environments, uh, when I read that over, I, I would meant to look it up, but um, is, that, is that referring to uh, like the, the kind of data masking, like the tidy evaluation stuff? I think um, it's I think it's because the environments are objects. Like when we when we speak about first class functions, it's because functions are objects. Oh, the same thing of the environments. They're like any other object. I see. Like, okay. Okay. They can be called cool. the transform it. Transform it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was confused about that, but that makes sense. So, okay. So here is the basic format of HTML. Here's, we have, if you never see HTML before, which I think you had. And HTML is usually used in the internet and is actually very used with the R Markdown because R Markdown usually transforms the Markdown to HTML. When you do, when you use HTML for So in the HTML, we have the tags like h1, p, image, img. They're called, they're called tags. The tags have attributes like id or source at source or width. And they, and there are different kinds of tags. tags. Some tags have contents like te texts, like he, the h, h1 has a heading like this, and image has no test, it's a void uh, tag. You see that they start and end differently. The normal tags, like they actually start and end with the whole name and the void ones, they just start with a backlash minus. I don't know how, how to call it. So, and also we have to escape some card. We have the ampersand here and we have to call it ampersand end is how we escape it in HTML. So we have to think about the escaping. We, and then we have to con construct the tags and the void tags, okay? So to do, to do with the escaping, the best, the easiest way is to create an S3 class. So we have, to, we, so we can make the distinction be, in between the regular text that needs to be escaped and the HTML text that doesn't need it. <laughs> First, we create an HTML function, HTML class, just like a function of the structure ADV HTML. I will just call it HTML, uh, the class. And we, we can create a print uh, method, just like get the text and print to and paste it with an, an HTML. So if I use the HTML hello world, we get, I gotta have a HTML hello world. You see that is it, it's just like this SQL example. We just like it just put something in the print, in the print method. So 
Now we have the class, we have the HTML class. We can use a function to escape the, the characters. We create, we first create the method escape.character. Escape so we can, you, we can choose, choose the, some common characters that are escaped in HTML, like the ampersand, the minus, the, the more larger than, no, larger than, greater than. That's the L here. Okay, you have this ampersand and the symbols, and you have then the NSML. They just sub is they just sub functions like replace. It will replace this with this. And we have the escape the escape for the HTML class that doesn't do anything because the fun the text is already escaped. Some examples. If the escape with random text, which will give back and the text in the HTML class. If we have the escape in the, here we have the normal test again, but the text has two, two uh, three characters that need to be escaped. So they are here. Now here, we'll have the HTML class, the text in the HTML class, so nothing happens. It will just return the, the inputs. And finally, we have the, we use, we use the class directly. So the escape also doesn't do anything. Great. So I say, I thought this is really a neat, like a simple, but like neat application of like kind of um, uh, generic, a generic, as a generic method, right? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, generics for different, for the, for classes and say, I like old me or current me would have like done, accomplished this by using like an if else statement and checking the type, you know, like in the, in these, in this escape function. Um, yeah. And, and, and kind of doing different behavior depending on what, uh, instead of defining its own uh, uh, generic for each uh or uh, yeah, I'm losing all the terminology for a few chapters ago, but uh, generic for each type. I, I I wouldn't. I guess I would have done differently, and just, that just struck me reading that. Yes, I think we. Uh, it's like we usually don't use classes like they are hidden. They are because they are purpose. purpose they are hidden on purpose. We kind of like think they are something very difficult because there is not. You don't usually have to build classes in R, so it's not common to think this way. But yeah, I also think that was a very simple example. Okay. Wait. Hello? Are you from? All right, now we got you back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I think my All brother right, is probably now. playing something. We're okay. We have the. <laughs> now, now continue here. So, just a little bit about the basic. We. Now to construct some basic tag functions, well, you first Hadley first constructs the p function that is a paragraph in the HTML. So an HTML tag, like I like I said, it can be it can have both attributes and children. The thing is, the attributes are usually named like class is here, and children are not like some tags and b. They are not named the arguments, so it's. So what you usually want to do is like to separate them. You want to get the named arguments in one place and get the non-named arguments in the other. And one way of doing this is with the dot 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 and our lang list you, which I'll show you here. Now the same as number from before we have p a paragraph some text. This text is in italic. And you have the class, my par my para. Don't know. And now we look at how list two would work inside P and how it work it would work inside I. So uh, I create a, a simple function, get the HTML attributes. So it only arguments is a dot dot dot, and the uh, the three dots are passed into a list. I then here what what happens? The all the arguments are transformed into a list. So the list, some arguments have names and some arguments don't. Okay. 
here we have the attribute va attribute values yeah you you get the attribute values with as character dots so you get all the text there's some text there's some type text and macara and then you set the names of the you set the names to the values okay so first you get the the text and then you get and you put the names in the text if i use it inside i it will only get the text, some italic text. But if I use inside P, it will get some, some text, some italic text, but my para would get the class because the class have a name and will set the name in, will set the name here. Okay. Here is the the how do I call this function dots partition? It will get list you will get the dot arguments. And then we separate the argument. We get the we get a boolean, boolean vector with this name with the name arguments and the non-named arguments. And then we cre we create a list. In the list, we have the name arguments named and the unnamed arguments with their name. And remember, name arguments are usually attributes like class ID. HTML attributes and the unnamed arguments are usually text. Texts are like uh, text in italic in bold. Just an example using dot partition with this a, a equals one, two, b three, four. The named arguments a and b are in a name in a name it, the list name it, and the unnamed unnamed are uh, the unnamed arguments are in another list. Okay. okay, so then we have, now we can create the function for the paragraph. The function get the dots partition. We use the dots partition to get the named and unnamed arguments. The attributes are the named arguments. It uses this function HTML attributes that it, it takes the name list and transforms it into a string. I didn't go much into that because how did I say it was complicated and I, be, I just believed in it and it's just because there are some weird defaults in HTML when the function has to be, it's a little comprehensive to go over these defaults. So it's not like it's hard, but it's kind of too much. So, but you just have to remember that it takes the list and return the, the, specs, the attributes as a, as a string. So you have the named attributes, the named attributes, and you have the children. And like the children don't have name, you can just use map to transform the list into a character. To escape them, sorry, to escape them and transform into a character. Then you just use the paste, you paste the attributes and, info, and you transform it into the HTML class. Like if you use P, some text, and ID, some text you will be for, first you part, partition the arguments, then you escape them, and then the HTML would, would be like P, the name of the attributes, get the name of the attributes, and then the content, which like some text and whatnot. Same here, some text, then we have the arguments, and for no, you have first the arguments and then you have the text, like the child. Okay. I think it's nice, like, it, but remember, this is just for one function, the, fun, the for one tag, the tag P, but we can create a general generalized version of this with, with the function tag. Function tag is actually a function factory. You create, uh, so we can create function, so it has it receives the text as an argument. You can create you can create the function for this tag. It uses the function an R link function, your function. It just like you create the function in parts, like the function has three parts: the argument, the like the body, the expression, and the environment. And you give each part, and you have to give each part explicitly. Now there's this weird thing here 
but it's just like you ha you're passing the dot dot. Like the dot dot is the uh, argument like this, like here. The thing is dot 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 is uh, it's like uh, is the name of the value and the value has no default, like it's empty. So we have to first, it's weird. In the text, it always says that it's weird. Then you have the function, there is all of this. And use dots, you make the partition, the at, get the attributes, get the children, and use and you create the HTML code. Is this, this is exactly the same as here? And and you, you for lastly you call the color ring. The color ring is where you want your function to it's like the function. The function will exist where you call the function. For example, I call tag B here with the tag B. Now I have my function. See that here in the HTML, I'll write B in the, here was like the, what's the name of this? The bang bang. Yeah, it was like the bang bang face, but here we already have the, yeah, here we already have the B, B here and here. Or the show bang bangs, and now you have the the tag. And since I call it in the global environment, it exists in the global environment. It's like the function environment. Coloring. Yeah, I thought this is kind of neat uh, how he's creating kind of slightly different function fun functions with different function bodies depending on uh, the argument for tag. Um, like, I think when we first saw a new function, I didn't quite understand why you would want to use it. And now I kind of get it that you can use it kind of pro programmatically to um, kind of easily create new functions uh, with slightly different bodies. So I think it's neat. Yeah. It's kind of tiny. Shiny has a function named tag. And mm. it kind of remains, it kind of reminds this, resembles a little. I think. Because like since it's much more robust, it had like a lot of the part is hidden, but it's like it seems similar the tag function to the one in shiny. It probably mm -hmm. works this works the same way, but the function in shiny is much more complicated. Because in shiny you have the tag function, you have the P, you have the P, you have the H1, you have all the HML, you have a lot of HML attributes as functions, and they actually all, all call the tag function. It's like the tag function is, is the function factor to all the... Yeah. Now you can create... That's neat. It's a cool Yeah. You see, we can, you, now we will create some functions and some void tags too. We can create P, we just use tag P, B, I, and now we can use the, we can see in the example before. With P, B, I, we have P, class, some text, B, I, we have our HTML code. And now a function for the void tags. We have, I think this was supposed to be in the other slide, it's okay. So in the void, creating a void tag, remember that the thing about the void tags is the void tags, they don't have a, they don't have unnamed arguments. All the arguments are named because they're all attributes of the tag. So they are bored. And yeah, they don't have to think about the unnamed arguments, just uh, name it once. And they also have different here. They don't end with their name. They just start it. So just see the image, image, and now we have the functions very similar to the one with P. We, now we can create an image tag with HTML. I have to say this, I was kind of thinking if I have to do like reports a lot, it would be helpful to have some uh, HTML, HTML functions to do image because like Work with imaging our markdown is very weird sometimes. Sometimes I just prefer to put the HTML code. It seems much more easier to find answers. 
it's I think even with HTML and, la uh, and la LaTeX, all of these, I just prefer to put the images in LaTeX or HTML than in R Markdown. Because it's always, if you want to change a scale or something, it's not very good. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to use all tags, you have to give all tags to the R Markdown. So, Headlay gives a list of the tags in the void tags. And we just map the tag function in all of them. And we, and we create a list in H, HTML tags. And in this list, every element is a function. He put it inside a list because some of the functions are actually R functions, the same name of R functions. So we would mess up the environment, would mess up a lot the environment. So it's better to put it all in the list. Honestly, that slide blew my mind, the one you showed. Which one? Like how he's, this one, how he's like piping all the tag names uh, and then applying uh, the tag function to create. So there's a function factory basically from, from that, those lists that you showed on the previous slide and then doing the same thing for void tag. I was just like, it's so concise and like, I don't know. It made me smile when I read it. <laughs> Very nice. It's kind of pretty neat. Yeah. And then the right. idea of putting that, that list in an, in an environment that is the first one you look to so that you don't kind of have any weird conflicts is pretty neat too. But. Yeah. And the thing that it's like, if we have to use, I think that's the part he talks about the the environments because usually if you have to use the list you always have to be hml uh, dollar sign dollar sign the name of the functions but with tide evaluation you can just put the list at the as the the scope so they look for the functions in the list and so with hml makes everything here happens on the uh, on the namespace of the list So now with HTML, we have body, h1, p, image. You can transform everything in, in it into HTML. And with, with ML, we just impose the code and make it run in the list, in that, in that namespace. It's wild to me. <laughs> I just can't get over that. Yeah, it's very and, slick. And it was just that. It was everything I have prepared for today. I didn't want to get in the, because like when you see in the HTML, it's like everything is kind of simple and makes sense. And if I go to LaTeX, it would be, it's like, it would be just too confusing. To, which, when I read it, I thought, yeah. okay, this is a little, a, a little you're, too well, you're, Yeah, yeah. Um, what I was gonna say, you, uh, awesome job in the way. It's, uh, Super interesting. Uh, like, I think you gave a great, gave a great overview. Um, was you made, mentioned that point about uh, like in our markdown, you often will just do HTML directly yeah. um, instead of fooling around with like what the, the kind of our markdown syntax is. And I think maybe that's like a general point about like, I agree in a lot of cases that's true, like especially when you want something that's like kind of customized, um, that's beyond just kind of the bullet boilerplate stuff. And maybe that's a general point about like um, translating between languages. Like if, if, like, I feel like it's generally true that certain languages are built to do certain things really well, right? And like, and like if you are translating from one language that naturally doesn't do that thing, very well to another that does it really well like you'll get somewhere but like if you want to start doing like kind of more i mean maybe like deep db plier because they're so similar is like an exception but um with sql but like but i don't know what do you guys think of that and like uh at a certain point you're going to run into the design constraints of even the language that you're that you're translating from uh that you're more comfortable with or whatever um that that like you you won't be able to get the full benefit of using that other language through the translation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like yeah, I don't know. I, I, 
yeah it just seems maybe yeah. a general point yeah i think that is like the translation yeah i think it's the translation have since you have the first language it will be constrained by it and also like when you design something you have something in mind like when the what the i think the Iway Iway created our markdown he has some uses in mind if people have other uses it will obviously not not in not always will be it will be possible so sometimes it's just like i i actually like that we can just use html like if you have some bit that very complicated in, in our markdown you can just put html there like you don't have to but you can i think right. it's a nice trade-off like you have it is easy to use just as the R markdown, but you have this flexibility. Yeah, I don't feel equipped really to, to comment on what you said, Kevin, but simply because I don't know any other language in the depth that I know R. So it's really hard for me to, to know what is easier or harder in other languages. Um, I think that if I did, you know, if I were doing more in HTML or uh, something else, um, then yeah, I think that that adaptability, the ability to to map across from one language to another, would be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe also think about Reticulate. Have you ever guys ever use that or know what it is? Uh, the it's like a R, R package for translating um, uh, Python to R and R to Python. Um, after reading this, I would love to just like take a peek at the source code for that because. I imagine it's just like there's a ton of different conditions and scenarios they have to cover. Um, but like, I, I just was fooling around with it a few weeks ago and it, it did some things that I didn't expect it to do that I was really happy with. Like it was like in Python, there are dictionaries that are basically named lists in R and it just kind of like seamlessly, seamlessly turned a dictionary into a named list. And I was like, and I was like not even trying to do that. And then it just like did it because I left the code that way and it worked. And um, anyway, I, I thought that was pretty cool. And I would love to like, maybe not now, but to go into that in a little more in depth because I think it has a lot of the same concepts that we were just talking about. The only thing I've really done is try to substitute out a lot of stuff in SQL. So I use, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not creating many functions for it, but yeah, it's tricky. Like glue or like an yeah, interpolation type yeah, stuff. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, it was a really hard project. Um, but yeah, I had like custom logic that was supposed to override some like, I don't know, we get this code list from an organization and we have to like run our query against that, but then the clinical teams are, we have their own ways that they want to measure the same thing. So we have to like override the logic based on the clinical team's input. It's very challenging, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, can't, I, I can't think of how I would fit my functions using like a function factory or anything to, to do that. Um, but yeah, that's the only have you Have you ever used dbplyr? I haven't, no. Um, I don't know if, it, if we could use it in this case because um, we're mostly making scripts to run. So it like it exports out a SQL file. Um, mm. It seemed like that example in Jorge, your presentation in the chapter with like the function that just creates a query, right? Oh, Wasn't there yeah. one like that? Yeah, that translates SQL. Translate translate SQL. Is that a real function? Yeah. Is yeah, that part of dbplyr? Yeah, it's a function in dbplyr. I think it's the main. I thought it to be is... kind of odd, like the way that it. The dot the SQL is like valid SQL, but not really the way we would write SQL, I guess. Uh, I don't remember how, but there was like some some odd odd stuff the way that it was like arranged. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. The the not thing I thought was a little weird. Uh, like it wrapped a whole logical statement in a not function. Like an yeah. I let me take a look. I've never used that. I don't know. Maybe I'm doing SQL wrong, but uh, uh, I guess I haven't really done not in a list very often, but. Yeah, that might be the same for me. 
Yeah. I think it makes sense because probably the some parts are written the for being easy to translate and not being easy to read. So it's like it it kind of doesn't care if it's the same same way a person would write. It's just like it will work. It just right. Like it. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's a lot of notes here. Yeah. yeah, and it does, it like, single quotes, or the, I don't know if that's a quote, what do you call that, it's a, a backtick? It backticks all the, the, oh, yeah, that might the variable been. names? Yeah. That's a little weird, too. I don't understand that. I don't see it sometimes. Sometimes my SQL does that. I see it sometimes in my SQL that really? like this. But it's not yeah. like common. It is not like so common to just do it sometimes. I think when we have the names with two parts space between names or something like that. But it just do, mm -hmm. do it all the time here. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Oh. Does anyone have anything else they want to chat about here? Um, you guys are all going to go off and like, we're all going to go off and create a new uh, programming language? <laughs> no. Yeah, because there aren't yeah. enough already. Um, my son right. is in high school and uh, he just started, they started showing him C-sharp, and I didn't know anything about C-sharp. I guess it's quite a popular language of the Microsoft world. But uh, it was just like, they were showing me the syntax, and I was like, I can't help you, kid. I'm sorry. <laughs> How old is he? Or what grade is he? 16. He's, he's in uh, 10th grade. 16. Yeah. OK. That's pretty cool that he's learning that. You, um, yeah, well, are all these, I, are all these C languages like related? Sorry, go ahead. I don't think C sharp is related to C as such. Uh, Jorge, do you know? No, I think C sharp is related to Java, I think. Yeah, right, okay. I mm. think it's related to Java. It was a whole thing, kind of Microsoft used it to collaborate with Java. They need to create it, its own Java. It's, it's a whole thing, the C sharp history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, he, um, I thought Hadley like cited that this, he said he highly recommends, if you want to learn more about domain specific languages in general, I highly recommend domain specific languages, the book. And it's like about, I don't know, I looked it up and uh, kind of creating your own domain specific, specific language, I guess. Um, but. Hmm. Oh. Um, I guess one thing that I was a little bit confused about, um, I just remember one thing that I forgot to mention. Um, in that bit where there, where he constructs the environment with the named, um, the named functions uh, so that the, and then he puts that in like a tidy evaluates it. Um, yes. You know what I'm talking about? Um, uh, I guess like, well, actually, never mind. I was going to say, how does, I was confused about how it like references the function, but I guess if he sets all the names. Of those of each of those functions by the text or whatever the the name of the tag is, then um, then it becomes a function in that environment that you can call by that name. Yes. Right. I was just kind of, it was kind of confusing because like set names is is really is like I just think of it as like setting the names of a list or a vector. Um, 
but I was like confused about how it goes from there to like becoming a, a, a named function you can call, you know? Yeah. Could you share your screen for that, this that slide? Um, yeah, could you share that? Yeah, do you, do you have it for her? I think he is answering somebody. Oh, uh, yeah, I can probably find it in the, in the actual code. Uh, share here. Oh, you got it. Okay. You're back. Yeah, I was going to look towards that. Here. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think, yeah, set names. I, th I think it was this bit. When he creates the list, every name of the list, each name, yeah, each name of the list is actually a function. Like if you call HTML tags A, you are actually mm -hmm. calling a function. Right. And oh, like I get, just, like a, and that part makes sense because like you could if HTML tags is a list of functions, you could do dollar sign yeah. whatever the name is and and call that function yeah. whatever. Um, yeah, it, it's like H, when you use eval tidy, it won't call it will call directly HTML HTML tags dollar sign a a will this like in this evaluation a will be this function and abbr will be this one so it's actually a huge list like everything everything is in there so right. when you when you call h1 it will look for the name h1 h1 will be the function and we apply it Yeah. Can you go back two slides? That part, that's the part right there that I don't get. Like how it, Here? how it. Because uh, is void tag a, a vector and void tag is a function? Tags, oh. void tags. And then uh, void tag, void, is, a void tag is a function. Void tags is a and vector. Void tags is a vector. Yeah. And then here, he's taking the vector. Void tags. Yeah. Here have the vector, you're setting the names and then mapping. I guess, and I guess that function set names without a name list will just name it using the names of the, of the, of the value, using the values themselves. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're there, it's not, because not, you, like when I use set names, it's like, a, I think it's from stats or something where it's like capital N. Yeah. And no underscore, and it's like you you have to pass both the 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 vector and the name vector, the values and the names. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, but yeah. So so what, I guess what I don't understand is what you just the, what you just were talking about, Jorge, where you said like you were saying that like you have this list of named functions, right? And then you go to the next slide, and what I don't really get is on the next slide. Um, so like. So like you, you're quoting, you're like capturing whatever this code is. So in this case, it's like body H1 with the, the, the content of H1 and the attribute ID and all that stuff. And then it, um, and then it evaluates it in the context, context of that list of function names or names function, sorry. Um, so I guess like, I guess that's how eval tidy like works. Like it'll, Oh, wait, hold on. Let me think about that. I guess it's similar. I think I get it, actually. It's similar to, like, when you do tidy eval with, like, a data mask, where the data mask is, like, a data frame. Yeah, yeah. A data frame is just a list a list of named uh, vectors, right? And so it's kind of the same thing. In this case, it's not a list of named vectors that's, like, data, but it's a list of named functions. That is and so when you refer to H1, it actually refers to the name of that list. And that's kind of how a valid tidy works. Yes. The name of the item in the list. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I think I get it. <laughs> it's so intense. It's, it's very slick, but it's, yeah, it's really hard to yeah. put it all together. 
Yeah, I guess I just didn't, until now, didn't think that deeply about how Val Tidy is working with that environment stuff, with like the, the data mask, like with the closure or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that this is very good. When I first saw the, the names of the chapters in the book, I, I thought this, this one was like, okay, what is this chapter? Why would I translate my R code to other things? But it's very good like to wrap up the last chapters. Like I think the last two sections, the meta programming and the functional function functional programming, like it wraps up the both sections very well. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand all the bang bang paste. It's oh the bang bang paste. I think it's yeah. just to like to hold the evaluation of paste for when you call that when you create the function. So here we have bang bang paste tag, but we will actually want to evaluate tag. We want to evaluate tag. The this bang bang paste is this the minus bang bang tag, and this one is here one. This one. It's turning B, yeah. I think it's just to, so you can make this transformation. So like this thing will run when you come the function. Because like he doesn't of, want literal oh, paste. I get it, I get it. He doesn't want literal paste in the function there. Uh, yeah, it wants to be wrong. Yeah, it's because EXPR needs it to, to do that step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To evaluate it within the body the expression before uh, capturing it. Or I guess I just thought the bang bang would be on tag and not on paste. Yeah, I was far, If I had far. to recreate this, I would have spent hours trying different combinations <laughs> until I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. probably put in tag and just frustrate, frustrated by the bang bang. But I guess that's a that's a good observation too, though, that like if you bang, bang, and then there's like a function to evaluate, but then there's also a, something inside the function to evaluate, it'll kind of recursively do that or, or start in the innermost part, evaluate that, and then like go out until the bang, bang, you know? Wow. Yeah. Like this chapter, like all this code is like so con concise and he's just like, like, it's like, there you go. You can translate HTML now. Like, <laughs> like four functions, you know. I don't think it's everything, but, but it's still pretty, pretty, pretty cool, I think. It's tricky some of this stuff too, though, because like when you need help with it, the help is all for HTML. It's not for these converted functions, you know? Like if I'm trying to understand how to do something tricky with an image tag or something, um, right. you know, now that we have this image function or like in Shiny there's an image function, but there's not all the help around it that there is if I'm just looking up, you know, how do I adjust the HTML mm -hmm. image tag? I don't know. That's something that I've kind of run up against with it. Um, yeah. So you've, uh, in terms of Shiny or? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Wait, like when you've done stuff with Shiny? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like nice that they're the helper functions, but if you don't have a good understanding of the HTML itself, um, it's like kind of harder to mm -hmm. manipulate. Mm -hmm. but if you have that level of HTML understanding, you don't need the helper function. You would just write the HTML. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. Like, Like, it's translating in the sense of like, it's putting the syntax into uh, a HTML readable script, but then, but then the, but then like part, so like syntax isn't only like the, the, the whatever you call that the triangle thing, right? It's not only that stuff and like how the tags are placed or whatever, like he, they're mimicking the HTML structure with like, the structural part with like that translated, those translated functions, you know? So like in a way you're still, you're still kind of like 
doing HTML in a sense, you know what I mean? Because like the nested structure is still there and like the logic kind of is still there, yeah. but you're doing it in like an R object, you know, like, I don't know. Like to me, it's like, it, it, it's almost, I don't know. It's like, it's like you're, um, you're kind of like painting in a different color, but you're not like, uh, the code a different color, but you're not like, uh, in that case, it doesn't seem like it makes it any easier to make HTML code if you don't know HTML. Yeah. Maybe it makes it less intimidating because like, you're like, oh, it's just a, a R function. Like, and you know, it's just a list and just a well, named argument. Like I can, I can do that, you know? I think it can be helpful because you get all the syntax highlighting of R if you just put it in, in double quotes or single quotes or whatever, you don't get any highlighting for what part of the HTML you're, you're working on. You know, it's just all, you know, in my case, like gray text or whatever. Um, but if you, if they're all wrapped in, yeah. in our arguments, you really can see like where you're missing closing parentheses and stuff, which equate to the closing, um, yeah, greater than sure. Um, so I guess you get kind of the deep mm -hmm. in the head by doing that, but, uh, that makes sense. Cause there, that feels like a real translation because like, uh, it kind of is serving a similar purpose. Like you understand what that thing is in R and like it's the same type of concept. Um, I don't know. The DB plier stuff seems to make the most sense to me in terms of translation, because like, when I look at a tidyverse pipe, like there isn't a whole lot different besides the ordering as, as compared to like SQL. You know, like I, I could see how that's like a natural uh, translation opportunity. Um, but it does really annoy me in SQL how like the order is like opposite of what it, or it's like, you know, it's like kind of like inside out what it is in R um, for like tidyverse pipes. You know, like you like, like, I feel like it makes the most sense in tidyverse where you're like, I want to start with the thing I want to take data from. And then I want to figure out what I want to, how I want to transform it and group it and, and summarize it. And then like, but like in SQL, it's like, oh, how do I want to summarize it? And at first, you know, and then you like, and then the last thing is like how you're filtering it, you know, and, and uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like SQL is like you have the first you say what you want and then you say it how you want it. It's just like, it's just, I think it's the side of a query language. Like I want this variable, this variable like this. And then you, you just start right. in steps. Like it's like your goal, like your goal, like you, you're like writing out your goal and you want the end product to be. Yeah, that makes sense. That's an interesting way of looking at it. I, I like that. I like that perspective on it. Um, I guess like it depends, like if you're doing like interactive programming or interactive like kind of data exploration or you're like, uh, you kind of know what you want. Um, maybe that makes a difference, but I kind of, I think I'm going to read or try to read over some of this articulate stuff and just see what what's there and if I can actually understand it that would be an accomplishment I feel like but, uh, all right do you guys have anything else you want to discuss or no see the mic dropped get to go for the presentation um well thank you all right this is great uh, a lot of fun uh, Jake, did you say something? Thing I'm thinking say about, you know, like a, a show and tell. I, uh, yeah, I was just like really excited this week. I, I am like trying to rewrite this function that we, that everyone on the team uses, um, but we're trying to like break it into two parts. Um, Cause yeah, uh, there's kind of like a data manipulation piece and then a plotting piece. And right now the function does it all in one. So you give it this like big, this big list of arguments and it like, we'll do the data manipulation and, and plot it. Um, but we're trying to like break that into two different steps. Mm -hmm. um, but people who are using that, people 
we don't want to break the API or, you know, we don't want to break like how people are using the uh, original function. So we, I still need to like leave all of those arguments in the original function, but the two new functions, like I only need some in one and some in the other. So I don't know if that's like fully making sense, but mm -hmm. I, it's been cool to like say like grab all the arguments that the user supplied and then tell them, and then like go look in the formal arguments of the prep function and the formal arguments of the plotting function, mm -hmm. grab the ones you need. And then I use the do call to apply it. It's very cool. Um, but so it's just like, they can pass everything they want. And then I just like grab what I need and send it off to their respective functions. But that was like, I would only have so it, out through, uh, you know, this group. <laughs> that's awesome. That's really, that's yeah. awesome here. Um, so is it like, a, is like, a, like, is this new, is the, are the two new functions kind of like wrapped by the old function in a way? You know what I mean? Like, like, so like, is the old function now just those two functions like nested in it? You know, yeah. the two new functions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have like a little um, example that I can, I can but share. You can, we do like that. Uh, that's, yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Um, but you can, you can call the two new functions, the each part individually. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I say like grab all the arguments that the user supplied and then, you know, take the pieces you need, um, and send, and send them off on the, the different, the two new mm. functions. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was happy to figure that out. I don't know. We'll have to see how, if it passes code review, I just sent it off to my, my coworker. So. He might shoot it down, mm -hmm. but uh, at least I, I know if something like that is, is possible. But um, yeah, but if it wasn't for this group, I wouldn't have even thought of something like that. So yeah, it's a lot of like match call, formal args, that kind of stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh man, I just found the uh, converting uh, code. Okay, I'm pretty particularly. I'm gonna have to sit down with this. Cool. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, hope you guys have a good evening. Um, so, Mike, I'm gonna change the schedule. So, Mike presents next week, and we're not gonna do that recap. And then, um, and then yeah, uh, we just need someone for the 11th, uh, or not the 11th now, the fourth now for chapter 24, improving performance. Um, let me, we let me can figure Ezra's that out. Also. Back. We haven't okay. seen Ezra in a little while. Um, but I feel like yeah. this could be up his. Wait, own. you guys work together? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, that'd be cool if he was able to do that. Um, but, uh, if not, I'll, I'll take it. But, yeah. Okay. Right. okay. Just a little All right, I'll leave that open then, and then we'll just we'll just figure it out um, later. All right. All right. I hope you guys have a good evening. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks again, again. All right. See ya. Yeah. Bye.